Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Beyond the Metrics, Creating Meaningful Engagement Through Communication. My name is Katie Brewer, and I'm the Program Director of the Project Management Executives Council with the Conference Board. I'm pleased to help moderate this timely topic to help leaders as they navigate new ways to communicate with their teams. Today, we're joined by experts from LimeAid who will define employee engagement, talk about what's not working in the engagement space, show, uh, describe how to show care and be connected, describe how to show care during crisis, and they're going to wrap up with some key takeaways. At the end, we'll have some time for questions from you in the audience. For those who are interested in earning continuing education credits, you'll get credit if you attend the entire webcast. Please type your name, email address, and the credit type needed in the designation box below. If you wish to earn CPE credits, please also check the three pop-up boxes that will appear throughout the program. Today's presentation will be led by Lauren Franken, Franklin and Stephanie Leitman from LimeAid. LimeAid is an employee experience software company that helps build great places to work. The LimeAid platform unifies employee well-being, engagement, and inclusion solutions with industry-leading communication capability. Lauren and Stephanie are responsible for brand management at LimeAid with the exciting roles of working with customers to optimize their employee experiences and bring market insights into the LimeAid product strategy. Today's topic is extra special to both of them as they are passionate about the impact that employee experience can have on positive engagement, and especially right now with everything that's going on around us, this conversation is more important than ever. I'd like to turn the presentation over to Lauren to start. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Katie. It's great to be with everyone today. Um, before we jump into talking about care and connections and going beyond metrics to really use communication to drive employee engagement, we just want to start us all off with some definitions. Make sure we're on the same page. When we say employee engagement, what do we mean by that? At LIMA, we define employee engagement as a deep connection and sense of purpose at work that creates extra energy and commitment. What's different about this is that word energy. Employee engagement isn't just, I like my job, you know, I have a great desk with a nice view. It's about that feeling when you wake up in the morning, you're brushing your teeth, and you're thinking about work, and you want to be there. It's all about that energy. And these are the types of employees that we want to have at work and retain, because they do the best work. And in fact, the impact of employee engagement is vast. It's actually one of the most studied topics in HR literature. So we know that engagement not only impacts the bottom line, but it also impacts things like how safe people are at work. Disengaged employees are five times more likely to have a safety incident. And again, this is one of the most studied topics so you're just seeing three results here. The impact of employee engagement is really deep and it's wide within organizations. So we know that it matters to companies and it matters to people. We all want to be engaged at work, right? Like who wants to wake up in the morning, brush their teeth, and be scared to go to work? I want that feeling of being really excited. So let's talk a little bit about, well, how do you get to that point? How do you see those results of extra energy and that commitment? What you're seeing here are the drivers of employee engagement. These were actually collected from our LimeAid Institute. It's the research arm of LimeAid. And we've collected this data over about 14 years through what we call our well-being assessment. And we looked at what impacts how engaged somebody feels at work. And these are the top results. And what's really interesting about engagement is that these things are very personal to every employee. So for example, what's a you know, manageable stress-wise and work hour-wise to me might be really different for Stephanie. 
So somebody who has a lot of meaning and purpose in their work and they have that extra energy, maybe working a 10-hour day doesn't save them as much. But when you're lacking that meaning and purpose, that could shift a little bit. So you can think of these as the different levers you can pull to impact employee engagement in your organization. And one of the things that's really interesting about the employee engagement space is that we've known a lot of these things for decades. It's a very studied topic and very known in the HR space and organizational psychology literature. Yet the approaches have been pretty much the same in what organizations do. And we've seen very little change in overall levels of employee engagement. And I want to pass to Stephanie to talk a little bit about the impact of not really changing up that approach. Thanks, Lauren. And to Lauren's point, there is just so much that we see where uh, engagement is just missing the mark. If you think about it, what we hear is that so many people look at the surveys that you're delivering and you're spending so much time, how can I get the survey out to all of my employees? How can I look at all of the data? First, it's about getting all the employees to participate, and then it's looking at all of the data and analyzing and figuring out what to do with the data. And almost by the time we turn around, it's how do we put it in action, but we're almost ready to bring the next survey forward. And so I'm guessing this is a frustration that many of you might also hear or feel. Um, and as we go through the next 40 minutes together or so, we're going to talk a lot about how we bring those day-to-day -day interactions into reality and how we move from that survey frustration into day-to-day -day experiences that really are going to have impact, how we take that grid that Lauren just showed you and change the storyline into not just asking the questions but reacting to what the employee needs. And so think about those frustrations. If you want to start putting those, those in the chat as you start to formulate those questions, hopefully we're going to start to get to a lot of ideas as we go through the rest of the session. But I want you to start thinking of those because our goal is to get to address a lot of them today, but also as we get to Q&A later, make sure that we're really helping you walk away with how are we missing the mark today and how do we improve it going forward. And when we think about what are we missing, what's, what's really missing the mark, we wanted to share a couple statistics with you. And maybe if some of you are just trying to build that business case within your organization to change how you're doing it today, these statistics might give you a little bit more oomph to say, you know, we really need to change our strategy. Or if you have, maybe you've already started to change that strategy, but you just want to kind of get everyone else aligned. Again, these are just some of the statistics that are out there, but I think they just prove a point that um, we're all starting to see where current approaches just aren't really getting the job done, if you will. So the first one is about 35% of practitioners believe their engagement efforts lead to positive business impact. And so this is only 35%. And that's really the key to this, where we would like to see that number be higher. If only 35% believe that they're turning into positive business outcomes, that's pretty low. And so how do we really see that number change? As those HR professionals, how do we see our business outcomes get tied to greater results? And I think where it really can be done is when we tie that employee experience to the positive impact, to those areas that Lauren just touched on, and to this approach to really thinking about where experience is tied to engagement and how that day-to-day -day impact really changes. The next statistic you see there is about the number of engaged employees in the last decade being at about 30%. And the good news is we're in a new decade. It's 2020, so we all get to change that number. Um, Gallup even already started to report. They just sent out some new numbers of this decade, and it's gone up a little bit, but just minimally. So now is our time to change that, change that percentage, change the game here, 
to see that number of engaged employees go up as we've gone into this next decade. And think about where we are right now. We are in, we're in crisis. We're in this time that none of us have ever experienced before. Um, we're all in the same crisis, which I think is also something we've never experienced before. And engagement right now is as relevant as it could ever be. And we're going to touch a little bit, as Katie mentioned, on this later about putting some of these practices into the reality of, um, of, of this crisis we're in right now. But think about how important engagement is right now and how much we need to move that 30% up even further in this decade. And then lastly, this number of $550 billion per year of um, the cost of a disengaged employee. That's a pretty high number. Um, and you all can do the math against your own employee counts if you know what your engagement numbers look like. But more importantly, I think let's talk about the positive impact an engaged employee does have. And we also know that there's a lot of good positive revenue outcomes that come from those engaged employees. So you can almost flip that number to a positive number once you get to an engaged level of employment. And so what we wanted to do was really try to hit the mark on what's missing so you can see the impact of why we need to change the storyline and why we need to change, change it all for us. So enough about what's not working and enough about um, hitting, hitting home on that. Let's talk about what does work. And so, Lauren, do you want to share a little bit more about how we can put the employee first and make that employee experience the key part of engagement? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when, when Stephanie and I were preparing for today's discussion and this webinar, we very intentionally chose that title of Beyond the Metrics. Because in that employee engagement space, it's often a lot about measuring and the numbers. And you know, as Stephanie called out, that's not really you know, resulting in the impact that we intend. And so it's really about flipping the script and thinking about how do you focus on the employee as an individual and communicate effectively and thoughtfully with them so that they can take part in their experience of engagement. They're the one feeling that sense of energy. And so it's important to start thinking about employee engagement not as a number that you get from an annual survey, but about those individual employees and how they experience your workplace. And so Stephanie and I wanted to make that come to life today by telling three different stories about employees within organizations. So we're going to set up the stories for each employee around kind of what's, what's not going well. What is their experience today? And then we're going to flip the script and talk about how that could be different if they had those moments of care that you know, happened throughout the day that started to change how they're experiencing work. So let's go ahead and jump in. I want to tell the story of Josue. He's a marketing manager. He's only a couple months into his role on the marketing team. So he's brand new out of the organization. He's fresh. He's excited. But he's starting to realize that he's taking on a lot more responsibility than what was described during his interview process. He started to notice that his weekends are being consumed by catching up on email. And he's worrying about what he has to do on Monday when he wakes up on Saturday. Actually, he gets those, those Sunday scaries, that feeling that we don't want that doesn't lead to engagement. His engagement's quickly waning at work. And he finds himself just extra tired most, day, most days before work even starts. What's interesting is that his boss is praising him for all the great work he's doing, and he hasn't even noticed Josue's lack of energy and excitement. Despite only being a couple months in, Josue wonders, how long can I keep this up? Next, let's meet Aparna. And so Aparna is a receptionist at a remote location in her global company. She's, she's that one that keeps the office moving. She's respected by all her colleagues. She has amazing organization and attitude. She's that smiling face you see when you walk in the door every day. Um, one day she notices an opportunity to apply for a women's leadership course. And it's offered by the global HR team. And she just needs to talk to her supervisor to get approval to apply. She's super excited. 
This is her chance to expand her skills and connect with others and maybe even just feel a little bit less remote. She can really connect with the broader company. So she approaches her supervisor. During the conversation with her supervisor, her supervisor makes it pretty clear right off the bat. She says, you know, I think it's a great idea that you want to apply, but your job is here. It's to answer the phones and greet the people. And you know what, Aparna, you do a great job. You keep us organized. And you seem to be really happy doing that. And so I don't see why you need to really go forward with this leadership course. And plus, I kind of need you 100% here. So I don't know if any of you can kind of um, picture this kind of scenario, but Aparna goes back to her desk, and she's frustrated. And she starts to get disengaged. And she feels like her opinion not only on her job, but also the overall company is shifting. All right, and finally, let's talk about Cameron. So Cameron is a doctor working the graveyard shift at a university hospital. It's her first week on the job, and she's feeling at a loss for where she fits in, who to go to for what. Her manager is so busy and stressed out and has really little time to just make sure that Cameron has the information she needs to know what to do to be an employee at this organization. Cameron is just wondering, does she even know that I'm here? And as much as her peers try to help, they've been at the hospital for so long, they don't really know how to point her in the right direction of where to go to find her paycheck, understand her PTO balance. So soon, Cameron just kind of fades into the background, doubting if this is really the right place for her. All right. So we've set up the story of three different employees. And I'm sure that you know all of you that are joining us on the call today who are responsible for HR can probably picture some employees in your organization who maybe have experienced similar things, right? We've got Josue who's having that feeling of burning out, um, too much work and not enough support. Or we have a partner who wants to expand her career and grow, but isn't feeling that support from her supervisor. And finally, Cameron, who is eager to get to work but she doesn't even have the most basic information to do her job. And I know these are the problems that a lot of you are tackling every day and care so much about solving in your organization. So let's talk a little bit about how these could have been different. So I want to start with Josue. Again, employee engagement is about these day-to-day -day moments. It's not about that number. It's about how these employees experience your organization. So how it could have been different for Josue are just a couple small moments that reminded him he's cared for, and teach him how to take care of himself. So it could be something from the CEO, some sort of communication, just saying, I'm grateful for all that you're doing right now, and having Jose feel a part of the hard work of his organization. Or it could look like some sort of recognition from a peer. Hey, I see what you're doing. It means a lot to our team, and you're brand new. That's awesome that you're jumping in and contributing right away. For Josue, it could even look like activities and content that help him improve his well-being. So he's starting to feel that stress and that pressure even on the weekend. So maybe it's about his manager checking in on his team's well-being. Or for Josue, taking that time to recharge and being reminded to do that. Or maybe he just needs basic skills to understand, well, I don't even know how to take care of my well-being work. How do I do that? It could be actual content that's teaching him how to do that. So let's shift into talking about how this could have been different for Aparna as well. So Aparna, if you remember, she was excited about the opportunity to grow her career and to take the next step for herself and also to get some visibility in the company. She just wasn't getting that encouragement from her supervisors. And I think one thing we also see, especially in larger companies, is that we don't have a good way to help employees and supervisors have a consistent path for growth across the organization. So what if Aparna was more encouraged to talk to her manager in a consistent way, or if managers had a path to have those conversations and the tools to speak more with their employees, or even encouraging Aparna to communicate with her peers? and share what her strengths were. 
often these remote teams can just feel disconnected from the bigger company. And so a few examples here that would really have changed um, the outcome for Aparna and even her supervisor. You know, giving her um, managers those supporting tools, so giving the managers the guidance to say, somebody in your team might be disengaged, and here are some ways to bring them along. Or for Aparna, here are some of the building blocks for you to implement better career growth. And so by offering these tools, you can ensure some commonalities across your organization and not just leave it up to those individual managers and employees to navigate their way. One of our customers, I think, had an interesting approach where they actually implemented a talent marketplace. And so this was a way for talent in the organization to find a new career path. And this was a huge growth, a growth opportunity for the organization as a whole. So think about how people could find new opportunities for themselves and how the organization could also find those employees who were the right people to put into those new opportunities. And think about what that would have meant for Aparna in this time where she was looking to grow her opportunity and just didn't find the right manager to help her take that next step. And sometimes showing care isn't about you know, a big investment like a talent marketplace. It could just be as simple as in the case of Cameron making sure that she had the information she needed to just feel like an employee, feel like those things that are sometimes really cumbersome and have to go to a, you know, various places to take care of are all in one place for her, and she has that information. So it could look like just you know, some sort of communication with her over the phone. Hey, welcome, Cameron. Here's everything you need to get started. And it also takes that pressure off of her, off of her manager. Managers matter a lot to engagement. In fact, they are the number one driver of engagement scores. So essentially, they impact the scores the most. Um, and really, that's a lot that we ask of our managers. Um, and so what can we do to support them as well as their employees is making some of these things easier. And that would have meant a lot to Cameron. So not only would Cameron be getting information around, well, how do I just get set up? But she has an ability to ask HR directly some questions around how she can get started. And then for her manager, it could be about receiving nudges and reminders of how do you connect with your direct reports? How do you establish that rapport with them and make them feel really welcome? Um, so the example of Cameron, I think we can imagine this in some normal circumstances, right? I think right now it's not normal circumstances for a lot of healthcare organizations and a lot of healthcare professionals. Um, so, you know, what, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is make sure that we're acknowledging the current situation and what's happening in our environment and knowing that there's even extra care needed, not only for healthcare workers, but in every space right now with the fear and uncertainty around what's going on with COVID-19. So what we wanted to do is take a little bit of time to hear from you all around what your organization's are doing to demonstrate care. So we ask that you could just share it in the question and comment box, but we're hoping that we can start to make this idea of how to show care and communicate with your employees come to life in the examples that you're experiencing as employees right now. So go ahead and take a second to type in that comment box around what employees or what your organization is doing to demonstrate care for employees. So we'll give you a second to just type those in. And then I'll read out some of the ones that I'm seeing. I see virtual check-ins as one, daily virtual check-ins, providing updates via email, updates from executive leadership that's super powerful that it's coming from the top, shift bonuses, snacks, big one. Virtual connections, live chats with the CEO every week, virtual happy hour. Oh my gosh, look at all these ideas. CEO voicemails, COVID-19 EIP resources. Wow, that's amazing. Look at all that care. A hotline, centralized location for COVID-19 related information. 
people that have made the tough choice of freezing hiring but committed to no layoffs. Leadership sending dinner gift cards. That's really cool. Slack channels, more WebEx calls. So hopefully this has given you some ideas around how to show care during this time by just learning from your peers. You know, we shared some ideas with Josue, Aparna, and Cameron about in normal circumstances, what are some things you can do to remind these employees that you care about their well-being, you care about their growth, you care that they just have the most basic information they need. But today that looks a little bit different. And I just thank you so much, everybody, for contributing those ideas to today's conversation. And um, for those of you joining us, please put some of those in, in your pocket to take back and implement at your organization. So Stephanie, I'm going to pass back to you to talk a little bit about how, you know, this during this time, how we demonstrate care in crisis, what we're doing at LimeAid, and just continue this conversation around ideas that we can do to, to show care. Absolutely, and the ideas are still flowing in, which is amazing. Um, so hopefully either you're typing or you're also writing down ideas to bring back to your organization. I think that when um, Lauren and I set out to build this session, we were not at the time we are right now, and so it was interesting to uh, tell the three stories we just told and then rethink them again sitting where we are today. Um, and um, especially Cameron, because we have workers now that are working in our essential and on the front lines. And so we wanted to take a minute to talk about what we're calling um, care in crisis, because when we think about engagement and we think about the job of all of you as HR professionals, you know, you show up every day to drive better employee engagement, and now you're being challenged and um, given the awesome um, challenge of making employee engagement shine even harder. And so I commend all of these amazing ideas that are in there. And we wanted to also add one more uh, story to today's session and talk about Joe. And so Joe is a manufacturing worker. And so he is one of those essential workers who is still going to work every day. He has two kids at home, and they're not in school, so they're doing their homeschool lessons, and he has a partner, but that person is also working full time. And so on top of all the pressures of work, and his kids are now at home trying to navigate homeschooling, and he basically shows up every day, but he's worried about his job, but his, also his own protection, his ability to stay safe, all the things that I'm sure many of you are also just noticing amongst your own employees. And so during these times, where we can make sure that care is showing up is even more important than ever. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how care shows up for Joe every day. So each morning when Joe comes in, he sees a new video from his leader. And it's a different leader. Um, every day to make sure that he gets to know the different people that are supporting him every day. And these are real and raw videos where these leaders are sharing how they are coping with what's going on. You know, I think more than ever just being honest that this is a time where we can be our own personalities and share that we're what our backgrounds look like, and what our families are dealing with. So these are those re real videos of how we're all dealing with it. But it's also tied to the values of the company and why it's important for this particular organization to still be working and what they're doing to um, deliver the goods that they're delivering during this important time. And then it's also filled with what's the company doing to support Joe and the other employees, and then what are they doing to support the local community? So Joe knows that he can be proud to be part of this company, but also where his work is appreciated. And then, of course, we know that Joe has kids at home, and so he has that fear, like everybody does, of potentially getting sick. 
and now more than ever understanding what are in his benefits and where will things play out if he needs them. That access to information is super important. And so, you know, how can he ask HR all of those really critical questions and get real-time answers? And so he has quick access to be able to ask HR all those questions. But as he asks those questions, HR is also populating those answers more broadly because this is a time when probably everybody else has those same questions. And so they're populating the rest of the organization with those questions that are relevant for a broader group. And then lastly, and I saw a couple of you also put this idea in, your, in the chat, he's getting access to public information. So he doesn't necessarily have time to check the internet for what's going on outside of his day-to-day -day job. And so he's getting access to World Health Organization updates, to community information and closings. So he knows what's going on. He can stay connected. If it's impacting him or his family, he has that pulse of what's going on around him. So he can feel comforted that he can focus on his job, but also be connected during a time when things are happening really fast. But most important here, I think, is that Joe also needs to care for his well-being. And so with the long days of balancing stress, everything needs to also stay within focus. And I think we have to do this all the time, right? We all need to care about our well-being, but more than ever, we can't let that go. And so there are recognition programs where Joe is encouraged to you know, say thank you to a coworker who went above and beyond, or vice versa when Joe has helped out. And he's reminded now more than ever to take those breaks when he needs them, um, to have those mindful moments, take a breath, get outside. I think that we um, can forget about those in our everyday life, and now more than ever having those be automated and occur when it's most relevant is really critical to Joe. And so what you can see here is that we've talked about all of these examples where that day-to-day -day engagement and the day-to-day -day experience is the importance of how engagement can really happen. And at times like this, when we're all sort of battling with how to handle it during a, a crisis like we're going through, these are some examples of where that care can really show through and where that added communication can be really impactful at a time when it matters most. So just to kind of bring that back to the how do we handle it right now, we did want to share some ideas. And I can't even begin to comment on all the great ideas that have already gone through the chat. So. Um, at the bottom of our slide, you'll see a URL for us at LimeAid. You know, our, our mission is to bring well-being to the world. And so we've already um, posted on our website a handful of tools and resources for you if, if they're helpful to help you also think about ways to care for your organization through this time. But we wanted to also make sure that today was about some great ways to rethink engagement beyond the metrics. Think about how communications can really bring forward that day-to-day -day, um, experience. But as we talk about care and crisis, we didn't leave you with these big ideas of forward-thinking technology, but we stuck to also some things that you could be doing right now to bring engagement forward within your organization. So we listed out a handful of ideas that probably could use what you have in your organization today to get started. And then if you can see in the chat, I see a lot of amazing ideas like weekly town hall meetings and videos where they're doing specific thank yous to those employees that are still on the front lines. Um, and so it seems that people are already taking this into account. But um, hopefully, if you haven't started some of these things, you're getting those ideas and are ready to put them into action. And I think the key is that use what you have already, the vehicles you have in place, and make sure that you're getting those messages out in a regular basis and you're meeting those employees where they are through the channels that you have. 
and then plan for this to go beyond what we have today to be a regular day-to-day -day experience that you continue. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lauren so we can talk about some key takeaways and then open it up to some more discussion. Awesome. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, so cool to see all those ideas in the chat. I mean, gosh, we didn't even need to put that table together, huh, Stephanie? There's so many yeah. really cool ideas. Um, so before we wrap up, we just want to summarize with the key takeaways from today's discussion. Um, first and foremost, we hope you see that engagement is a day-to-day -day experience. It's about those employees, those employees as people who need to feel cared for in your organization. It's not about those one-time surveys or just hitting those numbers. It's really about how you can communicate that you care and make sure they have that information that they need and the support that they need. And then the other thing we talked about is how technology can really play a role in this. I think that we're fortunate now that we live in a time where um, we have great technology that can help us, and it can help us really personalize the experience. And so many of you come from all different industries with different types of employees, and so use the power of technology to really be personalized about how you approach your employees and think about that engagement journey and what matters to those employees in different ways and technology can absolutely help you there. Yeah, absolutely, especially right now when we're really extra dependent yeah. on it. Um, and I think in that light, the final point being that there's no better time than right now to show care for employees. In fact, I think many of us could argue that it's more critical than ever to just really show that care um, and remind employees of, you know, that you see them as, as, as human beings, especially during this time. And so we hope that today we were able to, to leave you with some ideas for how to do that um, at the individual employee level as well as in your organization. Um, we are so grateful for this time with you today, and I know we're going to pass back to Katie for questions. And just a, a reminder for all of you on the phone, uh, Stephanie and I are happy to take questions even after today's session. We can be reached at info at um, Again, that's info, I-N-F-O, at limeaid.com if you have additional questions or ideas that you want to share after today's session. So Katie, I'll go ahead and pass back to you to lead us through Q&A. So everybody, um, if you've got questions for Stephanie or Lauren, please add them in the chat box. Um, very early on, Laura asked a question. Uh, we have upward of 11,000 employees, and approximately a third of that population don't have work emails. Um, the population is also engaged in production-type work at our casinos. They're not able to leave mid-shift to come to a meeting or town hall. What's the best way to engage with this type of group? Stephanie, I feel like that's a great question for you and your sure. expertise on what we call a deathless worker. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a, it's a real challenge, and I think that, um, you know, reaching a population of folks who, frankly, just are not used to being reached is definitely a challenge. I think there's a couple of things to think about. You know, one is, we do now have technology to one of our takeaways that allows us to reach those folks easier. But the reality is, too, that technology only helps you get to them. The, the, the um, important part is recognizing what resonates with them. And so one of the things we see work really well is try to understand, like put yourself in their shoes of what they really need. And it's a bit of a give and take. So you want to find out from them, you know, what do they need to be engaged and figure out how to start to take them on that journey. But there also is probably things that they are just looking for from you out of the gate 
that maybe you can provide back to kind of build that relationship. So if there are things that they're hoping to get out of HR that you can start to provide to them and start to build that trusted relationship, we find that that opens up those channels to those folks that maybe generally didn't participate in these conversations. And then that builds a relationship that starts to become a little bit more um, trusted, and then they participate even more. So um, I'll give an example just so it becomes a little bit more clear. Um, I was talking to an organization that found that their um, manufacturing workers were just struggling to ask questions to HR. So they just started with a simple, like, easier way to ask HR questions. And that started the dialogue of like, oh, you're listening to us. You hear one of our problems. And then when they started to ask more questions, surveys, and things like that, they had already started to say, where are we? Where can we support you better? We've given you a few things. Now we want to learn more. And it kind of grew from there as a relationship to now let's start to be more engaged as a group. And so think about those people and versus just trying to get them to answer surveys off the bat, think about what they want that you can start to do for them better and build that relationship. And then I think they will start to want to participate more in surveys and be part of the process. example um, to give everybody. Um, you know, I know that it, there's a great deal of focus right now with COVID going on and people having to work from home and everything, but what are the best ways to get an organization C-suite to buy into the critical importance of engagement on a long-term basis? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Um, it's, I think it's a, it's a challenge that many organizations face to get that buy-in. Um, and that continued support for, for investing in these efforts. What I would say with employee uh, or executives, what works best is starting with the numbers and starting with that business case. Um, so we shared some of those earlier in the presentation around companies with high employee engagement have 2.5 times higher stock price growth than those with lower engagement. Um, and again, this is something if you want to follow up with us, we're happy to provide more of these stats. But I think with the engagement stats specifically, we know that there's kind of a, a result for every leader, for lack of a better way to put it. So that, that stat around stock growth, that might be really important to your CFO. So how can you provide information to various executive leaders that speak to what they care about and the results that they're responsible for impacting? So I brought up the results around safety incident. So the average cost of a safety incident for an engaged employee was about $63, compared to an average of $392 for a non-engaged employee. Now, if you think about how many safety incidents an organization might have, you know, who's ever responsible for safety can start thinking about that, or chief operating officer who's trained to keep costs low. So my recommendation for those of you on the phone that are still trying to make that case and get that support is go do a little bit of research. Again, my mate's happy to provide some of those stats as well if you want to follow up with us. And make sure that the information you're providing to the executive leader that you want to bring on board is relevant for what they care about um, and speaking to them in those numbers and really helping paint the picture for why caring for your employees matters to the bottom line. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Kim asked a question, what are, the, what are some best practices for keeping furloughed employees engaged? Unfortunately, I'll, that's the reality right now. A lot yeah. of companies have had to furlough. That, that's a great question. I think that it's, I'm going to answer, but I don't know all of every company's rules for how they handle each furloughed employee, so I have to just caveat that you might have certain restrictions for outreach based on hourly versus salaried. But I think that um, it's important for a couple things. One is keeping top of mind with these employees to still feel connected to the organization and understand, one, how the organization is showing up during this time for you in other ways. So clearly they can't. Um, 
they can't do the general things of you know having you come in and work and, and pay and do those things, but they can show you how they care for you in other ways, whether it's still providing those resources or um, if that company is also able to serve the community and just being proud of the organization, staying true to the commitments that they are making, the values they stand for. So I think you shouldn't hide. You still need to be out there being true to the values and the culture that you are so that hopefully that employee sees you as a true and genuine company that's just being honest that that's where you are as a organization. And I think the second part of it is don't try to commit to things you can't live up to. I think we're just in uncertain times, and so um, over committing to things that you just don't know the answers to yet doesn't help either. Um, so I think employees would just care for the transparency. So give them the information they need. There are resources now they can take advantage of. Stay true to your values of who you are so they can still be proud of the organization they work for. And then also um, be transparent so they really know what's going on, so they can feel like they're hearing day to day what, you know, what they can expect. And I don't know, Lauren, if you have anything to add to that. I think that was well said, Stephanie, and especially what I want to touch on is the part that you mentioned around staying consistent and authentic. I think one of the things that's key for companies to remember right now, especially if you've had to do layoffs or furloughs and you're not able to communicate with those employees, um, it's about how do you maintain your brand and remembering that those employees are also consumers. So how are you treating your customers? And I even just think for me as a consumer, the decisions that I've made for businesses that I'm choosing to maybe not support beyond this crisis because of the way they've treated their consumers um, and not kind of thought about that, that human first and people uh, centric approach in times of crisis. So I think it's important to stay really true to the most genuine and authentic voice of your brand um, and how are you demonstrating that for your customers um, is I think really, really critical in these times, especially when you can't have those communication touch points and it's really about how you're showing up publicly and the way in which you, you, you treat customers. So I think Stephanie, you said it well, and I know that's something I've been thinking a lot about is just my choices as a consumer um, after this experience. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, let me ask you a question about um, employee engagement by generation. Would you treat millennials differently than baby boomers in the workforce um, based on employee engagement? Oh, I, I'll start this one, Stephanie. This is something that's really interesting to me. Another topic that I'm really passionate about is diversity and inclusion in the workplace um, and how different populations experience work differently. And what I would say to start with that, and I'm also channeling our chief science officer, Dr. Laura Hamill, right now and how she would respond to that question, is a lot of the research in employee engagement and organizational psychology it's also just human research and how humans, you know, expect to be treated. Um, and while I think there are some core differences to what workers expect, so we know that boomers kind of expect a different relationship from work, not as much what we would call mutual commitment, where they expect the organization to give a lot to them in order to give back. Well, we see that that's higher for millennial and especially now even as the Gen Z population is entering the workforce, they have really high expectations around what they expect at work. So I wouldn't say that it's about, you know, vast differences in how you treat people. I think everybody wants to be cared for in the workplace regardless of age. But I think it's about really constantly checking in with all employees to understand what are the resources that they need to feel most cared for. So everybody needs those. They might just look a little bit different. And that's why I think it's important to, in the, you know, we talked about the surveys. It's important to get that insight from your employees, but it's more important about how you respond to it. And knowing that millennials might provide a little bit different insight around the resources that they want to see. Um, but everybody wants to, to feel that, that sense of care. Stephanie, would you add anything differently to that? I mean, I know some of this is a little bit of 
hypothesis, especially with Gen Z being so new to the workforce? No, I, I would agree with everything you said. I would also just add that some of the things that we have seen is that we make, um, especially when it comes to technology, we tend to make assumptions based on generations that I actually don't see come true. We were talking um, recently about this whole um, process one of our customers went through where they were very nervous about um, a certain generation not being comfortable with an app on their phone, for example. And we make these assumptions. But I don't think that we can make all of these assumptions. I think it comes down to the person and how they react or respond to different things. And so we shouldn't get too over-rotated on generations and what the expectation is is per se when it comes to those levels of knowledge because we just don't know and so we need to learn a little bit too along the way. True. So Beth asks, is there a particular change management tool you'd recommend for helping managers become engagement agents? So I'll go ahead and repeat the question. I, I did see that some people are having a little bit of a hard time hearing Katie. So I'll just repeat it just in case anybody had a little bit of a hard time. Um, so is there a particular change management tool you recommend for helping managers become engagement agents? Um, you know, I, personally, I'm not familiar with a change management tool. But I would say in terms of helping managers become engagement agents, it's some of those things that we talked about in the examples with Josue, Aparna, and Cameron around delivering content to managers that helps them see how to demonstrate that care. And I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind with the information you're providing to managers is knowing that they are the front lines and it's a lot of pressure and expectation that we place on managers. So when you're providing some of those resources to help them become you know, engagement agents, I like that word you used, um, it's making sure that it's not too much. So most people can handle kind of about two to three things to, to learn at a time and two to three new skills to build. So I, I think it's about asking managers what are some of the things they're seeing from their employees, whether it's in a survey or if you're in a coaching capacity, and having them just focus on one to three things, a maximum of three things and not not overloading because I think it's really hard to, to have managers move along that change scale if they're trying to work on 10 different things for their employees. So starting with one, um, seeing how that goes, providing content to help them build that skill, but I think what's, what's really key is not, not inundating and overwhelming um, and slowly kind of dripping that, that content in a way that allows them to retain that information over time. Um, in terms of, again, that change management tool, I'll have to do some thinking on that. And if that person wants to follow up um, at info.limeade.com, we're happy to share some more resources and ideas as well. Stephanie, any thoughts that you have or change management tools you've seen? Yeah, I don't have any tools particularly, but I, I, I like that you commented on the um, amount of information and, and that you can retain. I think that is really critical and, and getting out of the gate fast and overloading is not necessarily a good path to success. And so really thinking about how much people can can handle is, is really important. So I'm glad that you, you mentioned that. So um, for you, both of you personally, can you share what's been the best thing that Limeade has done for each of you to show care and practice engagement during this pandemic? Yeah, happy to. Um, well, I would say one of one thing that's that's really helpful for me is I'm a type A person, I'm a planner, and what I love that Limeade has done is they actually put out communications the week before for what's going to be happening the next week in terms of how are we handling work from home? Are there new resources that are available? Here's what's happening with you know, the government support package. Um, and I appreciate that they put that out far enough in advance that I can kind of go into the next week with some stability. I know that right now it's so uncertain, and I think that Lyme is really trained to communicate early and often in this. 
Um, and at the risk of making her blush, um, Stephanie's actually my manager. Um, <laughs> so I'm really lucky to get to work with Stephanie every day. And I would say as a manager, one of the things that she's really done is acknowledge that right now, even just the way I need to go about my day is really different. So I'm somebody that loves to be outside and go for walks. And she's like, get outside, go play with your dog, do what you need to do. I know you'll get it done. And I think just giving permission to take care of yourself when the workday has altered for many in terms of working longer hours, shifting to take care of priorities. And so I think just having that verbal reassurance that that's okay um, and also having Stephanie demonstrate that herself is, is really helpful and really meaningful. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, my dog's been floating around in the background here somewhere. Um, yeah, I think that um, uh, Lauren highlighted a few things, and um, I would add to that two other things. One is the, the transparency and the openness has been amazing. So um, we get weekly, well, they're not, they're not necessarily weekly because we try to um, move as quickly as possible. So on a regular basis, we get these uh, videos from different leaders in the organization, and they are those sort of raw, real sharing moments. And I feel like they've really just, they seem to just come at good moments. And I don't know if that's necessarily planned or just when uh, they have the time, but they've been just really good and inspiring. And just when you're about to feel like you're tired and you need that extra um, push when you hear from somebody else that's going through it as well and how they're handling the change. Um, it's been really great. And the openness of our CEO holds these regular Ask Me Anything um, sessions, and we have a lot of time to just ask questions and kind of uh, work with each other through these times has really been, I think, um, really motivating, and, and it's really been a culture of we're all going through this together, so how do we just help each other through it? And I feel that it's really inspired me and also helped me um, you know, feel good helping others as well. So I feel like it's been, it's been great. And, um, and then we have some fun contests, too, throughout it, too, which I'll, always is fun. So cute dogs, guessing photos, and all of that, too, gives it a little bit of humor through all of this, too, which I also think is important. Definitely important. Well, thank you both, um, to both of you, to Lauren Franklin and Stephanie Lightman from Lime. Um, I know that everybody will be interested in reaching out to you at info at um, with their particular questions for their organization. And thank you so much um, for your time today. Uh, for all who attended today's webcast, the conference board will be holding our Talent 2020 conference on October 6th and 7th in New York City. As a token of our appreciation, you can use the code KN1 when signing up for this event to receive a $500 discount. And if you enjoyed today's program, we have, please check out our other related publications and upcoming webcasts. You can register by clicking on the link found in the downloadable version of this slide deck. And I think some people saw the downloadable uh, slide deck under the screen. It says download files here. You just click on those items and you can download them. So you, you can register for those events by clicking on the downloadable version of this slide deck or visiting our website at conference-board.org backslash webcast. Thanks and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.